Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor for Shadowproof. I'm also the curator of the Dissenter newsletter, and welcome to this stream. We're going to go over some pretty, pretty bad takes on the Espionage Act and the FBI raid against Donald Trump or the unsealed search warrant against Donald Trump. And graciously joining me for this stream to go through all of this, all of our examples, is Chip Gibbons, a good friend and the policy director for Defending Through Rights and Dissent. All of our examples is Chip Gibbons, a good friend. So, so and welcome. The policy director for oh, Defending one Rights one and one Dissent. One minute, all of our examples. Right, I heard that. Uh, do you have a window open? I do. I apparently had a window open with the live stream, and I and then I'm like, oh my, I have all these tabs open. I'm sure you know what that's like. It's like, where is this talking coming from? Why okay. have you been talking to me twice? Um, All right. Well, uh, we know it's working, and we know that we're coming to you loud and hopefully clear. So, again, as I was saying, Chip Gibbons, the Defending Rights and Dissent Policy Director, you've worked on legislation to reform the Espionage Act, which, yeah, I did. As, as we'll learn uh, while going through the examples, that might be a, a near treasonous offense. Apparently, <laughs> I mean, I, um, I look forward to now ever trying to work on this issue on the hill again. Now that it is so <laughs> in line with Trump, I was probably correct if you'd have worked in the past tense here. Um, yeah, we'll okay, see what so, happens. Okay, so let's start off with um, I have a clip, a good old clip of Ken Delanian who's been called the CIA's mop-up man by The Intercept. Uh, he was vetting his stories or sharing his stories with the CIA before he was publishing them at the Los Angeles Times. He is a correspondent for NBC News. And so we can uh, hear this little bit here where he's uh, speaking on Meet the Press. This is today. This is on August 14th. So he did this. And uh, it's it's just a it's just a little bit that he had to say about the Espionage Act, but I think you'll pick up on Chip. I think you'll pick up on why this caught my attention. So does it even matter if these documents were classified? Because the three potential crimes that were listed in the search warrant don't require the documents to be classified. Exactly. That's getting lost here amid this debate about Trump's defense that he can declassify anything. None of these three, three statutes require that the information be classified. The DOJ's position is these are U.S. government documents, property of the government, not Donald Trump's. It's illegal to steal them, and it's illegal to uh, mutilate or conceal them to obstruct an investigation. And then you have the Espionage Act, which requires an intent to harm the United States, which suggests that the FBI ha at least has suspicions about the motives in storing these documents. Well, I mean, there's multiple provisions of Section 793 of the Espionage Act. There is the one that involves negligence, which perhaps Donald Trump is facing with. The other ones do not require an intent to harm national security. The wording of it is specific intent or reason to believe. Uh, with government employees, the way the intent provision has worked has been you signed a non-disclosure agreement or you got classification training. Therefore, by virtue of having drilled into your head by the government, if you ever leak classified information, you have reason to believe that it will harm national security. There was an incident where some APAC lobbyists were indicted under the Espionage Act and things did fall apart under the intent provision, but those were non-government uh, employees, which has, a, a big open intended question. But in the case of government employees, the intent provision has essentially been, I would say essentially read out of it because, because but, but, but they do some legal jujitsu to get to this sort of uh, proof of intent where they don't have to prove anything, which is just that like you signed a piece of paper. Uh, so it does not require, it, it shouldn't require intent. Uh, one of the things I've been saying for many years is, you know, the Espionage Act needs to require intent. I also, while I think reason to believe is a low standard, I also don't agree with the court's interpretation of, of how low it is. I, I think the government's got to it with too much. Um, I would love for the Espionage Act to work the way this man is describing it, but um, 
I mean, Donald Trump, I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, he only takes one Trump person on the jury, but you know, I mean, if you can say, I'm sure someone told him classification, you know, good, leaking classification bad, which is all the government has to, to, to prove to, to satisfy the intent provision. Um, and so and no, he says, no, no. Well, he, and he said he he speaks about motives. Uh, I can't tell you how many filings the government has entered to make it impossible for the person who is the defendant to discuss their motives, uh, and and so motive doesn't actually enter into an Espionage Act prosecution. Like the modern day government employees, it does not. No, it's an open question what would happen with a non-government employee because of the collapse of the APAC part of the APAC prosecution. Um, yeah. But Donald Trump, as president of the United States, the ultimate government employee. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't want to take anything to trial involving Donald Trump, but, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, but, that's, but, that's, but, that's, but, that's, but if he was treated like any other employee of the government, he would ha be having a rough time right now. Oh, yeah. It, well, okay, so. Uh, before we go through any other examples, let's just use this portion to, well, first, I want to say for anyone who is tuned in, thank you. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button for uh, the Shadowproof channel, just so you know when we do future conversations like this, you'll get the alert. Got to make sure I do that housekeeping item before I get too far into this conversation. But then I guess just for our own selves, I mean, is there anything you basically want to say about what you feel about all this, or do you want to just keep going through the examples? I just kind of like give you the opportunity to give a few minutes on it in general before we speak to the specifics. But really I was going to just go through why these are each bad takes and kind of let that be fleshed out organically, unless you want to like yeah. put out a disclaimer about any of this. I'll, I'll disclaim some things. You know, I'm working on a book right now on the history of the FBI and its role of the national security state. Uh, it is neither positive about the FBI nor the national security state. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Espionage Act. I've, I've worked on legislation to both rein in the national security powers of the FBI and amend, not just amend the Espionage Act, but specifically amend 793, the part that's cited in the warrant. Um, you know, and unfortunately the discourse here has sort of fallen into two hideous camps. One camp is people who have sort of taken Nixon's adage, you know, when the president does it, that means it's not against the law and sort of transformed it into when Trump does it, that means it's not against the law. And I'm pretty sure Donald Trump has committed some crimes, you know, most presidents have, but he's particularly dumb grifter. Uh, usually presidents are slick grifters. Donald Trump is a dumb grifter. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, you, so I, I don't think a lot of people who love the Espionage Act when it's used against Assange or Snowden, who love the FBI when they're going after Palestinians and Muslims and, and Black Lives Matter protests, I don't think they're good faith critics here. I think they're people who just want to defend one powerful person. And there are good faith critics of the security state from the right, from the libertarian movement. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the people who helped to build it and are now upset that it's going out to Trump. Uh, but I also find equally, if not more dangerous to be the people who in the name of getting Trump are promoting the national security state. And like, oh, you're against the Espionage Act, you must be a spy. So this is really distressing lows in our already low discourse that we have these two camps that have staked out really hideous positions. And if the rest of America uh, history is choosing between people who think Donald Trump should do whatever he wants and people who think the national security state should do whatever it wants, we're really doomed as a democracy. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel really positive after the last 72 hours of discourse. I feel very, I went on a 12 hour walk today, a 12, 12 mile walk today, not 12 hours, you know, for, for a reason. Um, yeah. All of you people on Twitter who drove me to walk for, for 12 miles. Unfortunately, I have this with me wherever I go, so I see the Twitter. Well, the one disclaimer I'll put out, I've put uh, a couple things through my newsletter, and then there's been a conversation I recorded with John Kiriakou on 
the search warrant that was unsealed and then discussing the potential of being charged under the Espionage Act with CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou. I will stand by my assessment that I still think it is unlikely Donald Trump will be charged under the Espionage Act for reasons that involve uh, the example of David Petraeus, who was passed over, who actually used his legal team to be able to bargain with the lawyers so that he only was charged with a misdemeanor. And uh, just, just the fact that uh, I'm not entirely convinced that this is a road the Justice Department wants to go down yet because of the fact that it really does mean being at war with a former president heading into the re-election of Joe Biden or the potential re-election of Joe Biden. So I'm bringing in some political questions into all of this, which it is a that's the thing that people need to know. It's a very, it's, you, you won't hear this in any of the assessments of the Espionage Act so far on CNN or MSNBC. And actually, it might leak into Fox News, but it's bad faith and entirely disingenuous. It is a pretty political decision at this point in our history to charge somebody with an Espionage Act violation. Um, and if they are being charged because the Justice Department sees that as the law that is most useful, like because they mishandled classified information, then, um, you know, they're doing it because there's no politics that are going to interfere with their decision to go forward and charge that person. And also we need to recognize there are actually different types of cases. And what's really incredible about what's happened with Donald Trump is he's not being prosecuted for doing the things that we normally defend, which is that somebody yes. went to the press and blew the whistle and exposed something that we all need to know. He's not being punished because he took any documents and gave them to a media organization. He's he, he's being he's not being prosecuted at all, but he's not being put under this threat of possible criminal prosecution because he blew the whistle. He's there because he took these documents. They're in his home and he's possessing them unlawfully. And it's not really clear at this point what he was planning to do with them. Although I know the Justice Department probably has their suspicions. It's likely in the affidavit that we're not allowed to read, but the Knight First Amendment Center and other groups are going to try to get that unsealed so we can know the truth about this investigation. But um, I I'll stop there. Before I, I agree with you 150%. I was waiting for you to say one thing so I can jump on you for disagreeing yeah. with you, but everything you said, I'm 150% agreeing with. Oh, you thought I was going to say something that you just No, I was. I know. I was wait. I, I was a joke. I'm sorry. I was joking. <laughs> okay. was, uh, jokes are funny when we explain them. That's what we used to say when I was in college. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. uh, let let let's One, get into this. Let's something. get into this. So first, we've got the set of people who are living online and um, spreading their bad takes, and then I've got a few um, CNN takes. And uh, the only reason why. It's a bit lopsided or it will be, seem lopsided and I don't have enough MSNBC uh, people to, to call out is because uh, MSNBC doesn't make their transcripts available in the Nexus database. So that's just uh, that's just uh, unfortunate that CNN is actually very easy for me to tell what they're saying on their 24-7 news network. All right. So here's Tristan. Okay, by the way, I don't know any of these people. I'm not really making judgments about these people. And other than the fact that they have influence, so the reason why they're on here and we're talking about them is because they have hundreds of thousands of followers who are able to help them share their bad takes. That's why they're here. Uh, so this is a lawyer, a founder of Main Street Law, who has repped mid-sized businesses, entrepreneurs, etc. cetera, uh, says he prosecuted the Trump University when he was working for the New York Attorney General's office, and he's a commentator on CNN and MSNBC. What did Tristan say? For the warrant to cover the Espionage Act, there had to be probable cause of espionage. Not just a what if Trump gave classified docs to foreign agents. There was proof presented to the judge, witness testimony, video footage, other documents, something tangible proof. And you're burying your hands in your face or your face in your hands. And uh, yeah. Oh, what? So, so there's <laughs> there's many different uh, actual parts of the criminal code that fall under the Espionage Act. The part that you and I usually discuss, not always, but usually discuss, is 793. 
This is just unauthorized disclosure, losing, mishandling uh, national defense information. There's another uh, part of the Espionage Act, Section 794, that is giving national defense information to a foreign power. Uh, Donald Trump, the warrant was not on 794. It was on 793. If they had probable cause, Donald Trump gave the information to a foreign power. Depending on who the foreign power was, um, they, they probably would have searched on 794 because that one, a lot more serious, not that 10 years in prison is anything to laugh at, but like, you know, that one carries the death penalty. That one carries life in prison. Yeah. Um, and and that is very, very different than 793, which all it requires, they had probable cause. He did one of the things under, we don't know what section it was. It could just be the negligent section. It could just negligently handle national defense information or it could have been unauthorized retention. Uh, but nothing in the statute mentions foreign agents. No. Um, not just a what if there's proof presented to a judge. I mean... Well, there's proof for the warrant. Yeah, there's uh, proof the for justice, the warrant, but yeah, it's the cause. It, I mean, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, I mean... Yeah, there is evidence, but it's a lower evidentiary standard that requires a criminal conviction, or even a lower evidentiary standard that requires a, a civil verdict. I mean, probable cause is less than, you know, fifty percent certain. Um, uh -huh. to provide. I'm, I'm not going to make you go through the, the. I used to teach criminal procedure to high school students, and I would do the the pyramid of of evidentiary standards. Um, you know, a mere hunch is at the bottom. Uh, I, I said I wasn't. I will a mere hunch at the bottom. Then it's reasonable suspicion. Then it's probable cause. Then it's preponderance of the evidence, which is fifty-one percent certain. That's civil trials. Then it's clear and convincing evidence, which is really, really, really certain. And then it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And then there's absolute certainty above that. Um, probable cause is less than fifty percent certain, but more than whatever is required to stop you and harass you on the street. Yeah. So the big problem I have is the foreign agents. The idea that that well, but this is like not even part of the reported facts so far in the media. We all have accepted it's just boxes of information at Mar-a-Lago that were found. Um, there wouldn't have been. Um, oh, I mean, I, well, I mean, I guess he's saying that in the future Trump could give classified docs to foreign agents but it actually does not matter like there would be no requirement for that to exist in order for a judge to trigger subpoenas and warrants and allow the justice department to investigate i guess that's my big point is there doesn't need to be any presence of any interaction with foreign agents to do any of this you're 150 percent right again i also want to just go ballistic at this there was proof presented to the judge, witness testimony, video, <laughs> other documents. I mean, those are all types of proof that would be probable cause. But I mean, this but that's all for trial. That'd be for the trial. The standard for getting a warrant is very low. You can give, you can get probable cause for a warrant according to our Supreme Court based on anonymous, uh, anonymous tips. I mean, there's a very famous Supreme Court case where somebody told their hairdresser. They were a drug dealer and the hairdresser was angry that they didn't have to work for a living. And they sent this scurrilous note to the police like, there are some people in our community who don't have real jobs and they're living high on the hog. And they had no idea who sent this letter to be the hairdresser. And, and they, they searched the person on the Supreme Court ruled that was probable cause. Like if I call the police and say, you know, that Kevin, I don't like him, but I won't give my name. They'll probably come search your house. Kevin. They'll probably, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Right. I mean, the Supreme Court has gradually whittled away what constitutes probable cause. So I don't have high faith, you know, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky because I don't have high faith in the legal system to, to not approve warrants based on minimal evidence. I do not think given how hands off they've been with Donald Trump, that they would do something unless, you know, there was a, a, a whereas, whereas, but, I mean, who knows? We don't know. You know, that's part of the problem with the Espionage Act is that, you know, the evidence is all secret. Um, you know, yeah. the Daniel Hale sentencing, parts of that have been redacted. You know, I was in court when the judge mentioned the journalist was Jeremy Scahill 
And the documents mentioned the Horn of Africa. I'm currently in litigation with the DOD and, and NSA and FBI over the hail over a FOIA about this. And they've redacted that from the transcript because it's classified what reporter Daniel Hale gave it to. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. very early Obama Espionage Act um, prosecution. I'm blanking. The, Leibowitz was his name, I think, maybe? Yeah, Shemai. Yeah. He's and, an FBI linguist. Oh, that is such a confusing series of facts. But the judge in the case is like, the court's in the dark. I have no idea what he leaked. Yeah. I have no idea who he leaked it to, but I it's very serious. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Okay. But like, I mean, like part of the pageantry of an Espionage Act prosecution is that these this information is so secret, we can't we can't tell the court, we can't tell anyone what it is. I believe had Thomas Strait gone to trial, uh, his lawyers and them have spoken about it, would have talked in, have talked in code. They would not have been allowed to say the words fiber optics before before a jury because the fact that the government uses fiber optic cables is classified, you know, big secret, you know any Verizon court commercial you would have learned this from basically. But so I don't know. This is just, I'd love okay. the probable cause affidavit, but I will never get to. All right, let's go to the next one here. Um, all righty. This is Michael Beschloss. He's author of at least 10 books, according to his bio. He's on NBC News as a presidential historian. I think he was on today. Uh, but we're not playing a clip of Michael. Uh, he has been on a special series for Peacock, PBS contributor. Norma and, was sober. All right. And he's got over 800,000 followers who were sharing this. It had, at the time that I grabbed this, over 56,000 likes. And he says, Rosenbergs were convicted for giving U.S. nuclear secrets to Moscow and were executed June 1953. And I know that there's no editorial in this, but he seemed to be suggesting that this is how serious it is what Donald Trump did. And everyone was taking this as a cue to encourage like the execution of people under the Espionage Act, like Donald Trump. And then also, I think it was spreading a lot of misinformation about the history of what happened with the Rosenbergs because of the fact that, you know, there isn't anything here about how much of a scandal it actually is that they were both executed in our history. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything, Chip, but I got, I've got what Howard Zinn wrote in sure. his book, a people's history of the United States. I always lean on him. Great late people's historian who says, who wrote, it was not McCarthy and the Republicans, but the liberal Democratic Truman administration whose Justice Department initiated a series of prosecutions that intensified the nation's anti-communist mood. The most important was the prosecution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the summer of 1950. The Rosenbergs were charged with espionage. The major evidence was supplied by a few people who had already confessed to being spies and were either in prison or under indictment. David Greenglass, the brother of Ethel Rosenberg, was the key witness. He had been a machinist at the Manhattan Project Laboratory at Los Alamos, New Mexico, in 1944 to 1945, when the atomic bomb was being made there and testified that Julius Rosenberg had asked him to get information for the Russians. That's the testimony. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, his family and, and them, they always maintain their innocence uh, all the way up to their execution. I know that there's some suggestion that, I guess, on the Russian side, that that's, uh, or the Soviet side, that it corroborated it, Julius's role. Most people have, including the, the family, have conceded that Julius was, a, did pass industrial secrets to include about military stuff. To but not the, Ethel. Not Ethel and not nuclear secrets. Um, yeah. that, is, that is very debated. I will also point out that the nuclear secret they gave the Soviet Union allegedly is in, there's a picture of it in any book about the Rosenbergs and it's on the Wikipedia page. It's this infamous sketch. Have you ever, have you ever seen the sketch, Kevin? Um, no, where, where, just go to Wikipedia. I'm sure it is on Wikipedia. Um, it is, I think, 
technically inaccurate, uh, but um, it, oh no, I don't want, okay, I don't know what I'm doing on the internet now. Okay. So here it is. Do you see it? Um, the green it in diagram, yes. Um, I mean, this is. You're dropping it in the chat and I'll have to show I'm you. Doing that, yeah. I mean, if this was a big nuclear secret, I think it wouldn't be on Wikimedia. Wikimedia. Okay. A lot of books. I'll um, show people what you're talking about here. I'm not a nuclear engineer. I can't imagine anyone could 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 make anything out of this. I mean, the idea that the Soviet Union is so technologically unadvanced, they cannot develop a nuclear bomb without a secret. But right, they so this was the industrial espionage, and this is why they were executed. This is the alleged nuclear secret. This is this yeah. is this is the cross section of the atom bomb. Um, uh -huh. I mean, I don't know, Kevin, are, are you, I, I don't, I'm not very impressed by this. Um, I mean, the idea that the Soviets are so technically unadvanced, they can't develop a nuclear weapon, but for this very crude sketch, in which case they are now, it, it doesn't make any sense. But my biggest problem with this tweet, and I, I don't want to go on the history of the Rosenberg, because it's very convoluted, very complex, Yeah, um, is that they were tried and executed under what is now 794. Which is yeah. not which is not what the warrant was based on. Um, I mean, the criminal code was revised since then, but the, the charge they were charged under, and a lot of people argued they were mischarged. They should have been charged under the Atomic Energy Act, uh, which doesn't mm. count their sentence. That was a uh, a rogue attorney filed a, a briefing with the Supreme Court about this, and I believe uh, Justice um, Douglas actually temporarily stayed the execution, which spawned the first of two uh, attempts to impeach Justice Douglas. The, the second attempt, I, I know I'm off topic, but I have to tell this story, uh, was because he found the movie I Am Curious Yellow not to be obscene, and Gerald Ford brought up that he wrote, Gerald, that Gerald Ford brought up that he wrote uh, articles celebrating the rebellious nature of folk music, very controversial thing for a Supreme Court, in a uh, magazine that had lurid fit photos in them. And when they were doing the impeachment uh, testimony or hearing, uh, one of the people on the committee asked Gerald Ford, what did he actually say in these articles? And Ford could not, uh, or could not describe it. So this congressperson asked Gerald Ford, is anyone in your office reading the articles or are they just looking at the picture in this magazine? And that was the end of the impeachment. Uh huh. It's totally a necessary story, but you know, uh, you, you enjoyed it, Kevin. I, I appreciate it. So let's go to the thing that actually is dominating the discourse, unfortunately, oh, no. um, which is that Rand Paul, ever the villain and in the Senate, has come forward and uh, the Espionage Act was abused from the beginning to jail to centers of World War One's what he tweeted, and he added, it is long past time to repeal this egregious affront to the First Amendment, repeal the Espionage Act. Um, I don't think he intended to have that there, but it looks like he just like copied something from the Future of Freedom Foundation. Uh, so he's this is a libertarian outfit, right? And he's putting this down. Now, I do believe and you can say if I'm wrong or not, that Rand Paul has been out on the record of being against the Espionage Act before this event with the FBI raiding Donald Trump. Am I wrong or? I mean, Rand Paul, unlike a lot of people in his milieu, actually have legs to stand on. He has been an on-again, off-again supporter of pardoning Snowden, uh, most recently on-again he has criticized the use of the Espionage Act. He has criticized indictments under it. And he is, he is one of the few people in the Senate who I would say have legs to stand on on this issue. And the only reason why I make that point is because people are suggesting this is all opportunistic right-wing partisanship in support of Donald Trump. And I, I don't think that the record actually bears that out. And it's only worth it for me to say that not as a defense of Rand Paul, but as a defense of the work we do, because I don't want this to delegitimize our opposition to the Espionage Act, because now people are going to see Rand Paul once it repealed, and they're going to, oh, that's a right-wing scam to defend Donald Trump. And I don't I mean, think... Yeah. I have said this on Twitter. I do think that tweet was obnoxiously timed, and I do think it is clearly a commentary on Donald Trump. 
Yes. That being said, Rand Paul isn't perfect on this issue, but he's better than most people in the Senate. And that article is from 2019. I don't know what the Future Freedom Foundation is or whatever that's called, but I started reading the article and it is from 2019. The article, as far as I can tell, is correct, uh, down to the point where it said the U.S. should not have been involved in World War One, which is not the view of my employer, but, you know, it's my view. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. We don't have a World War One view, to my knowledge. I wasn't saying we're pro World War One, but you know, I'm I'm very anti the First World War. Uh, and you know, the tweet is correct. The article is correct. I do right, think so, only us, but let me go to the next thing here. Sure. I'm gonna keep moving here. So no, we got no. Charles Booker. And again, again, let me say this: I'm not making any statement against any person. I'm not making a statement against Charles. We are just judging the content of what was expressed in the tweet. I mean, he is running as a candidate against Rand Paul, and this became a very popular thing that we're going to show here. He has 444,000 followers on Twitter. That is a ton of people to be sharing this sentiment, and why I think it is worth challenging that he said, Rand Paul is now calling to repeal the Espionage Act after the world learned Donald Trump is under investigation for violating it. When I am elected to the Senate, you will never have to question my loyalty, my loyalty to our country. I don't know anything about Charles Booker. I, you know, defending rights to Senate is nonpartisan, so I'm speaking only in my personal capacity. I have a lot of issues with Rand Paul. You know, when he's right, he's right. When he's wrong, he's really wrong. He's wrong way more than he's right. Um, but that is a loathsome tweet. Like, that is just absolutely despicable wanting to repeal the Espionage Act, wanting to amend the Espionage Act is not cause to question somebody's loyalty. Uh, Rand Paul is a mixed figure here because he does have a record of defending Donald Trump, who is not a libertarian by any stretch of the imagination, but he also has a, a record of standing up against these Espionage Act problems. I mean, mixed, very mixed record. But yeah, it's on and off. I mean, when it's suitable and when his party doesn't get in the way of yeah. what he's trying to. But, you know, in the Senate, on and off is pretty good on this issue, right? Most of them are just off. I mean, know? yeah, they're just silent. They pretend like it's not happening. It's just like, oh, but what? The yeah. standards of the United States Senate, he has a very good record on this issue by standards of the types of people who you and I work with. His record is not great. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, but, look, Ron Wyden is probably preferable to Rand Paul just mm-hmm. because, but even so, maybe not because he actually doesn't stick up for some of the things that Rand Paul has been willing Ron, to do. Ron Wyden will not defend whistleblowers who are indicted under the Espionage Act. Yeah, no. Yeah, so... Mm-hmm. So it's even if he's got this commitment to reforming parts of the Espionage Act, he won't speak up for these individuals who have been targeted. So that's that's a problem. So, OK, so obviously your reaction is the same visceral reaction that I have to it. I resent the idea that you would be disloyal. And also, I think you have to extend it. If you're going to say that somebody who wants to repeal the Espionage Act is disloyal, then what does it make you to want to reform the Espionage Act? I mean. The thing that is so uninformed and implied in the tweet is that the Espionage Act is just perfect the way it is, and we should just let it exist and do its work against Donald Trump. And it, 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 if, if you don't know anything about the Espionage Act, which I think that's actually a fair amount of people out in the United States who are citizens, unfortunately, even though we've had this rich history of presidents using it against people, you just think that the Justice Department is going about this by the book This is particularly, I think, among a subsection of the left, progressives, uh, Democrats, the Democratic Party's base, the idea that this is just how it's supposed to be done against anyone and that there isn't really anything to be griping about, despite the work that civil liberties, human rights and press freedom organizations, which Defending Rights and Dissent is a part of, the work that you've all done to point out why it needs to be reformed or even completely abolished. Yeah, I mean, we've taken very hardline reform positions. We've taken some of the, the most strident of anyone in our community, and certainly more strident than most people in Congress. Um, I, I, we, we, I don't, we've never formally called for it to be repealed or abolished. I, I don't think if someone was seriously wanting to do that, we would stand in their way. I mean, there are provisions in it that do cover actual espionage. Um, uh-huh. 
but they're so out of date and antiquated. I mean, if you actually cared about espionage, I think repealing the whole thing and starting over would be yeah. good. I mean, we actually testified before the Senate in the 1970s about the, I didn't, I was not around Kevin, um, but our organization about, about, about uh, the Espionage Act and how bad it was. So we have a very long history of opposition to it. We also have a very long history of being uh, accused of disloyalty. You know, we were a victim of the counterintelligence program of, of the FBI. Uh -huh. um, so this type of rhetoric is very, very dangerous. This sort of equation of dissent with disloyalty, it, it's not just hot air. It does fuel these types of repressive policies like the FBI's counterintelligence program or use of the Espionage Act against Eugene Debs. Um, so I, I take this very seriously, especially coming from members of Congress or people who are seeking to be members of Congress. All right. I'm going to go through these next ones and uh, there's some similarities. So I think I'll yeah. show like three of these and then we can do some comments. So Adam Parkamenko is very outspoken, has over 600,000 followers. He's a Democratic strat strategist and consultant, uh, very aligned with Hillary Clinton wing or the Bill Clinton or the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party. And here he has to say that if Rand Paul wants to get rid of the Espionage Act, here's a, uh, and then he's basically saying that Rand Paul has worked with Vladimir Putin. And so suggesting that it's basically a Putinist thing to be opposed to the Espionage Act. And I'm pointing this out just for the sake of showing the, the, the discourse around criticizing the Espionage Act. We got Scott Shapiro here saying, or, oh, and he's uh, at the Yale Law School. Um, so he's a professor and he's got over 82,000 followers, not as many as some of the other people, but he said, yes, but not all acts punishable under the Espionage Act are classic cases of espionage. It's not a great political defense. Um, what so, is okay. Well, I mean, I guess we're wrong to point out the nuances, which I would think a lawyer or a professor in law would appreciate since that's sort of like what you do when you teach your classes. Wouldn't you think like, I mean, it's not a great political defense, which is why I don't think people who don't commit espionage should be charged under the espionage act. This part of the <laughs> why I'm so opposed to charging journalists and whistleblowers under the espionage act. And even if there is this other category of people who did something with classified information that we as society want to condemn, but is not espionage, I do not think they should be branded as spies because it is not a great political defense. Thank you, Scott Shapiro. Thank you for this brilliant insight. I, I concur. I look forward to you joining me. Oh, not her. Oh, boy. Okay, so Je Jennifer Rubin, a horrible columnist who rehabilitated herself during the Trump administration, used to be a rabid neocon and has managed to fold herself into the liberal uh, Twitter sphere said the Espionage Act violations, not technically treason, but it's close enough. <laughs> so, I, I, all right, so this, no, I'm not coming. Yeah, this, this guy is Andrew Wortman. I don't know anything about him um, other than I'm not going to read too far into his bio, uh, but he is someone who has over 147,000 followers and is um, identifies as a Democrat and uh, among other things. And he uh, said, if you're a sitting member of Congress tweeting that we need to repeal the Espionage Act, you do not belong anywhere near public office, much less the United States Senate. We get it, Rand Paul. You're a traitor. Now resign. Um, all right. So that gets shared. Here's Angry Staffer. This count has over a half million followers. Very popular while Trump was president. I think everyone was led to believe there were former Trump staffers that were running it. Um, I don't really know who is curating the content that comes from this account at the moment. They have a mix of politics, national security coverage, and snark. And this That's is what I do too. What? That's what I do as well. National security. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a standard. I think it, it it sells. It does pretty well on Twitter. We have a sitting GOP senator actively trying to repeal the Espionage Act. And then Rand Paul R. Moscow, which is which is very it's very helpful. Thank you. They to the work that I, that we're doing to challenge the the abuses of this law. It's great that it's I'm so I'm looking forward to while there's the war happening in Ukraine that this is gonna filter into our work trying to 
challenge civil liberties abuses under the Espionage Act. It's 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 just it's just fantastic. So one more is this this is actually a little bit of a palate cleanser. This okay. person's not in Congress anymore, but I think this is right. This is a good statement. Objectively, the fact that the Espionage Act may be used against Trump does not magically make it good, says former Representative Justin Amash. He's a libertarian, kind of like Rand Paul. Has a terrible history of abuse. Government has employed it to avoid scrutiny and chill free speech, and it violates basic tenets of due process. Nobody should be cheerleading this law. And he supported the impeachment of Donald Trump, right? He was... yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, Justin Amash is one of those people. Personally, there's a lot of things I very, 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 very strongly disagree with him on. Uh, but he is absolutely correct on surveillance. He's absolutely correct on foreign intervention, and I, I think he's a very credible commentator here. And I do think that tweet is a palate cleanser. And here you have somebody who broke with his own party to support the impeachment of Donald Trump, who is telling us the Espionage Act is bad. And Justin Amash was a critic of the Espionage Act when he was in Congress. He was a critic of both Donald Trump and the Espionage Act. And you can be principled uh, on these two issues. I, it's shocking, principledness in the age of Twitter. Um, but here we yeah. have. So we'll close with Tom, Thomas Drake, NSA whistleblower's thread. But I have a couple CNN examples to fold in here. Um, and I'll, I'll just read them. I've got the transcript in front of me. And... It's just text, so that's why I'm not putting it on screen. Uh, so the host essentially said to the CNN legal analyst, Ariva Martin, uh, in the list of potential crimes, some come under the Espionage Act. That doesn't necessarily mean spying, as it sort of sounds to the layperson, I guess. It's pretty broad. So take us through that. And I'm actually pretty glad that they made that point. But we'll see where the analyst kind of got lost. When we hear the word espionage, automatically I think people think that it relates to spying on the U.S. government. But that act covers things broader than just spying. It covers things such as the removal of sensitive documents that could land in the hands of a foreign adversary, someone or some governmental entity that is adverse to the United States. And we don't know exactly what is in the documents that Donald Trump removed from the White House, but we know those documents are highly sensitive. Many of them documents that were only meant to be reviewed inside the White House in the skiff documents that were never meant to be removed from the inner sanctum of the white house and the fact that these documents have been taken to a private residence could potentially end up again in the hands of a foreign adversary warranted the level of intervention that we've seen with respect to this search warrant and i suppose the thing that i since i'm reading this and it's a little bit harder of you to pick up on the thing is um you know the the, the idea that any of these documents have to ever end up in the hands of a foreign adversary for Donald Trump to be charged. You know, I keep, I keep hammering away. We kind of did this earlier, but as these commentators are, are, are reading these words in the law and acting like it's there in the alleged offense against Donald Trump. And I, as I get, I guess I beg of them to recognize that the justice department doesn't actually need all of that to bring these charges. And that's why we object and have very conflicted ideas about what is going on. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. They should bring Thomas Drake on. They should bring John Kerry yeah. on. They should yeah. bring anyone who has faced charges under this act and yeah, some of their experiences. All right. So this other one came from a CNN reporter who uh, basically got to the Espionage Act and described it as criminalizing the gathering, transmitting, or losing of defense information that someone would have reason to believe could be used to injure the United States and potentially help another country. That's a pretty serious crime. Other people have been charged with it, including Julian Assange. And I kid you not, Chip, just left it there. No context whatsoever. So now it's just Julian Assange and Trump and the people who are viewing have no idea about the differences between these two cases, which you could write an entire book about how different what Donald Trump did and Julian Assange has done. It, I mean, Julian Assange has been so demonized in the United States that I don't think a lot of people understand what he's actually accused of. So the fact that he is the, you know, seriousness of the Espionage Act, Act example just shows you how degraded the discourse is here and how 
how deranged. And then the last one from CNN before we get to Thomas Drake and end on a more positive note um, is to say, yes, uh, this is from Renato Mariotti, who's a formal federal, a former federal prosecutor. Uh, he has actually been on CNN a fair amount. Um, and this is just because it's cartoonish. Yes, it sounds like a law that might pertain to James Bond or the Rosenbergs. So something like that. Um, I don't really have to add the rest of it. But like the idea that you would bring up something unserious and like compare it to James Bond. No, no, it's not. Like, here's the whole point. The reason we've been having this conversation is to tell you that it is pretty boring. Um, you could violate the Espionage Act and it would not make for a great spy thriller that you would go to the theater to watch. <laughs> And once again, the Rosenberg 794. We're doing yeah, 794. Yeah, yeah, he does go wrong there. Yeah. I mean, that is part of the Espionage Act, but there's a lot of things in the Espionage Act. There's also, like, inciting a mutiny in the military in the Espionage Act, right? I mean, the Rosenberg's okay. relevant. So there's something I want to mention within this, uh, because it's coming tomorrow. Uh, you and... You don't have anything to do with this, and neither do I. But uh, Assange's attorneys are going to sue Mike Pompeo in his individual capacity for his alleged role in spying on WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. And there will be a press conference that will be streaming. Uh, there's a few who have been following and watching us have our conversation. They're interested in this. Just to let you know that uh, you'll be able to find the stream tomorrow to watch. Uh, a, a, there's a journalist, uh, I think his name's John Getz um, or, or Goetz, or I don't know how to spell his name exactly. He's a German journalist or he's done journalism for Der Spiegel. Um, and there's a few other people. Margaret Kunstler, I believe, is going to be part of the press conference. And these people are going to speak about being targeted and there are plaintiffs in this complaint um, that has been filed. They go after Pompeo. I think they're also going after David Morales too. They're going after the UC global director, David Morales. And uh, we've, we've talked about this in some detail, so I don't have to go over it with this audience, but if I was on CNN, I would have to like use all my time to describe it since it would sound it on completely right. new. They have no idea what I'd be talking about. Um, and they would think I was probably working for Rand Paul and that I was like a, a Rand Paul plant in the media or something like that. So here's, uh, let's just do Tom Drake and we'll, we'll end this. Thanks for joining me, Chip. I appreciate well, it. I hope there's been some kind of therapeutic value to going through all of this and sorting through the worst of the worst responses that we've, we've had this through. Um, so I'll, I'm going to put this on screen here and then, you know, kind of crude, kind of crudely read through some of these. Um, and you've got um, Thomas Drake saying that the Espionage Act, especially 793, that's what we're talking about, originated with a draconian World War One era heavy handed law during the Wilson administration. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to go through this. He's, he's, he mentions Alger Hiss, the pumpkin papers case. Yeah. And then there's a 798 provision that's added. This is a good thread to go find. I mean, people can see his account is at Thomas da, uh, uh, underscore Drake one at Thomas underscore Drake one. And you can follow him. He's an NSA whistleblower. I'm sure there's people coming to this who don't even remember the specifics of his case, but uh, yeah, you can look that up on your, uh, uh, on uh, your time and, 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 and read about him. You really should. Uh, but here's a good history. And he speaks to how he was targeted and how others like him were targeted under the Obama administration, uh, that the statute has been selectively and vindictively used to punish whistleblowers and leakers who disclose this information and in this regard, uh, he says they were treated like spies or as the government argued in the last stages of their Espionage Act 79-3 case against me, unclassified NSA government information ostensibly required the same level of protection as if it were classified. 
The number of leak investigations against other government officials, employees, or affiliates greatly expanded under Trump in terms of raw numbers with felony penalties added if a person violated 1924, which is un unauthorized retention, mishandling of classified. Now that, now that chip was in response to what Hillary Clinton did, right? And it's not That's mentioned in the warrant. Yeah, and it's not in the warrant. Um, okay, so whistleblowers like reality winner Terry Albury and Daniel Hale were targeted with the blunt force receiving end of 793. All these cases, as well as mine, also implicated the press, including reporters and journalists, as eyewitnesses to a crime. Yeah, a lot of times they said alleged co-conspirators. Yeah. However, under 793, a public interest defense is forbidden. So he says some stuff about that. In other words, criminal. As an Espionage Act violation to call out crimes and wrongdoing and concealment committed by the government, let alone attempt to hold the responsible and authorizing officials in government accountable. Um, I don't know. Is there anything you wanted to say? I can keep going. This is a good threat. This is a very good threat. 793 is extremely broad. And by the way, I'm kind of happy that there have been a lot of anchors who have just been calling it 793 and then getting people to respond. Because now that means that like, if we want to use this as late like lazy and not actually say what we're talking about we can and people might know what we're saying so thomas drake says 793 is extremely broad it's now the de facto official secrets act for all intents and purposes of the u.s government in these kinds of national security defense related cases especially when the content involves the public interest and the press critical point in this regard the government too often uses the espionage act as a punitive and suffocating suppression centric post facto prior restraint filter which in so many words is making sure that people don't learn this information about national security uh, issues. Yet this highly problematic Espionage Act is now the DOJ's go-to president yep. and predicate instrument for selective use and abuse against lower level whistleblowers and leakers. However, they are punished far more severely than the unauthorized leaks by the highest levels of government officials like, and then he would be referring to Trump who typically get off scot-free or receive a slap on the wrist would turn out incredibly rich if Trump were hoisted by his very own Espionage Act narcissistic petard with a multi-count felony indictment served on him and his Confederate accomplices. And yet, if Trump were indicted, could a dramatic appeal by his defense team go directly to the Supreme Court for a review of the Espionage Act or the Supreme Court accepted and pulled up for review from a lower court under conditions? Um, and he's basically saying that um, there might be a challenge to the Espionage Act statutes. And as he continues, he's saying, and there's no legal or legitimate reason for Trump to clap the truly massive troves of highly sensitive documents and spirit them off to Mar-a-Lago. Trump clearly took them for private gain, personal interest, to create his own secret classified coins of the national security realm collection. Yet what damage has he already caused? What injury has he already inflicted on the U.S.? What are those classified coins worth to the wrong people? Maybe Trump is the ultimate leaker to himself, extreme fawning loyalists and designated visitors, but his precious documents are now going back to the government on ice. And what was already copied, photographed, couriered, or transmitted to others from what Trump took? And then he's just, you know, now, Trump, now Thomas is talking about the, the seduction of these state secrets. And he says, we are definitely in unprecedented and uncharted territory with Trump's actions as president and former president, yet beyond obvious that he is a continuing national security risk who severely abused and misused his office on a multi-front, criminally negligent, and brazenly willful way for his own circus, con, game, grift, and games. And if an indictment that includes 793 charges were handed down against Trump, would he join the very small club consisting of only myself and Ellsberg, who were not incarcerated for 793 violations and remained free after we were charged with the same under the Espionage Act? That's interesting. I had never thought about that, Chip, that him and Ellsberg are the only two that never went to prison. Um, it's true. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think through all the cases. I've got my that, that, that scans, yeah. Or will Trump end up in a club of only one filled with the echoing mirrors of his own making? Finally, with regard to the Espionage Act itself, the statutes themselves, given their extra legal abuse and heavy handed misuse, one might make a case to repeal them or posit a better case for at least reforming them to support public interest disclosures and access to the court system, like your organization has done, Chip, to offset the one sided primacy of state power that excludes any public interest, especially with regard to government 
federal state malfeasance, wrongdoing, and abuse of the classification, classification national defense information system to hide and cover up the same while keeping those real espionage act or just plain espion, espionage sections, the plain real espionage sections. So um, that's that's what you were saying earlier, which is that there are the espionage parts and then there's this part that's been made into an official secrets act. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I had a conversation on Friday with someone who's an espionage act expert, even more so than I am. Um, and they were discussing the idea of if Trump was convicted. And I, I agree with you, he's not going to be indicted. But if he was convicted and took it to the Supreme Court, would the Supreme Court, out of loyalty to Trump, uh, limit the law? And, and they seem to think he would. You know, I don't I don't think the Supreme Court's going to pick Donald Trump over the national security state. But I, I also I also don't think he's going to be indicted. Um, I mean, if this actually went to trial, it would be it would be a real wild card. I mean, my, my prediction is that it takes one Trumper on the jury to, to, you know, prevent a conviction. Um, I don't see it ever getting this report, but who knows? Well, I'll say to you, I don't think the office can handle two espionage act prosecutions at the same time. We've never really seen, uh, them. Well, they kind of did, but they're pretty good at like staggering them. So, what would Trump, I guess Trump's would then leapfrog Assange and Assange is going to be waiting and have his health continue to deteriorate. So like if he was extradited, they'd bring Assange here. I'm suggesting to you that if Trump had to be put on trial, then that would mean he was going to be jailed for a longer, longer period of time here in the U S until they got around to him. Cause they'd be getting to Trump first before Julian Assange. Those are the same people that prosecute Assange, is what I'm saying. That's a good point. And that would assume Assange waives his speedy trial, which which most defendants do. Um, but that would be very Yeah, I hadn't considered crazy. that. Um the I know bureaucratic it's the bureaucratic issue, the fact that like all the resources that go into it. If they want to try Trump, they can always drop the Assange charges. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that would be a great. This is a great opportunity to charge wow. Trump and 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 save. You're busy, Merrick Garland. This is this is the perfect chance for you to drop the Assange charge. We're just too busy. And there would be no allocations that you were pro Trump by dropping the Assange charges because you would be <laughs> indicting Donald <laughs> Trump. <laughs> uh, well, so, we figured it out. We solved it. We figured it out. Everything. Um, okay. The last thing I want to say here is there's been one little irritant and it's not going to stop, but I will make my position known. Only one and, little irritant, Kevin? Only one? Well, no, there's, one, there's one irritant that I didn't get to in our hour-long conversation and um, I saved the best for last. I am the, the idea that people keep just nonchalantly saying national defense information, it, it kind of gets to me because that is a Justice Department construct and it doesn't really exist. Like there is no, there's not really any national defense information. Uh, there's top secret, there's secret information, there's uh, there's other levels, but national defense information is mostly uh, a conjuring that serves the purpose of espionage act prosecutions. Tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, I think you're probably right. I, I think there might be some case law where people have challenged national defense information being void for vagueness. And I, I think there might be some appellate history in the 50s where the courts have read something into it, but I'm I'm going off on a limb here. Yeah, I, I it's just so nebulous. It's But when you say national defense information, it's... It, it means everything. It means anything. It's just all information. It actually is a meaningless term because anything you could argue, any piece of information might be connected to the national defense. I bet if you brought an FBI agent onto this stream, like if we, if we had someone buddy who was, who, who we were willing to make like, uh, like some kind of like devil's bargain with and, and jeopardize our reputations just to have, this one conversation, I would sit with him and say, or them, and I it could be a woman. We we could talk to this person and 
ask them, you know, to just, we just keep lobbing examples at that person and they would have some way of tying everything we threw at them to the national defense. I don't doubt it. I mean, we could come up with something about uh, vegetables and grocery stores, or we could find something related to movie theaters. I'm sure that they would find a way to connect it to the national defense. It's what they do. That's what people in the Justice Department are doing daily. I'd be very curious to know if there was any internal guidance or guidelines on what constitutes national defense. I mean, these are such rare prosecutions. There probably isn't, but I, I would be very intrigued by how they interpret it internally. It just seems like it, they can do whatever. I mean, I've seen it with uh, some terrorism offenses that are brought against uh, environmental activists. I've seen it with, yeah, uh, they just, they just, you start like making a, I've seen them claim that like the infrastructure for train tracks is like important to the national yeah. defense. And it's just like, okay. Um, so, uh, so that's all. Uh, maybe you want to say where people can find your work and then we'll, we'll, yeah. get out, we'll get out of here. People can learn more about the organization. I've worked for defending rights and dissent at rights and dissent.org. Uh, we have lots of information about mending the Espionage Act, uh, a cause people might not be taking up right now, uh, but we do. Um, I've also written about the Assange and Daniel Hale prosecutions for Jacobin, and you can find me on Twitter at ChipGibbons89, where I am sharing much of my dismay at tweets like the ones we just got today. Well, and I don't doubt that I'll be back here with another collection in the next few days. I'll be periodically putting this together. And who knows, maybe I'll invite you back, Chip, to have another uh, hour rundown conversation. Maybe it'll be a little bit shorter next yeah, time. Intentional well, infliction of emotional it, distress. It's been, look, we've been able to like use our Sunday evening to casually go through these. Uh, during the week, we have a little bit more urgency when our time is filled with other tasks. Um, and you know, so, but at the same time, as I've been showing, these tweets have a lot of influence. They go very far and people read them and they have reactions. And I'm not saying I'm going to reach those people with this video, but I just think that in some small way, we need to use our platforms to clarify that that isn't exactly um, the way you should should view it. And I, I will say that I uh, was looking through the transcripts of what people were, some of the commentators that came on, and believe it or not, I think it might be far worse if it was just somebody who was right wing who hadn't been a former U.S. president. Like I think the discourse might actually, I think as bad as it was, I think it actually could be worse if it was somebody who wasn't even a former U.S. president because there has been some restraint in what has been said but uh that's all i can get that's all the credit i can give the mass media that, that's all the credit i'm willing to give and i wasn't ignoring you to text people kevin i'm looking at my phone because i was pulling up the supreme court case from 1941 where they interpret national defense information it's called foreign in the united states um i will i will read it tonight and i will tell you what it says okay well, it's been good chatting with you. It's been good chatting with everyone out there. Uh, for those of you, before you leave the stream, uh, do us a favor. Make sure you've hit the subscribe button and you're following so you know when we do another rundown on some bad takes. because They're not going to end until we have some kind of like final word on this. And I bet, I bet this story is here to stay all the way until the end of this year, probably. I bet, I bet the Justice Department will be trickling out uh, leaks uh, to the media or people at the Justice Department will be leaking about this case for the next four or five months and uh, it will be a part of the rest of 2022. So, um, and, and if that is, is proven correct, uh, Chip will be back here, I'd presume. So, thank you, I everyone. Back for something with the espionage act. Uh, it's not yeah. going away. It's Rand Paul repeals it on behalf of Russia. <laughs> Right. See y'all. Have a good night. Have a good one.